Pride can be a very dangerous thing in the NBA. And for a team like the Miami Heat, who was the top of the league for a large part of four years, even losing the biggest part of the big three in LeBron James, I don't think you can really blame them for being a little bit prideful. That amount of success can just feel normal. But with one of your stars aging at a rapid pace, another one going down with glaring injury concerns, this team looked like it was about to be forced in rebuilding, whether they liked it or not. But with expert scouting, amazing draft success, a great development team, and being a large market doesn't hurt, this team was able to get back to the NBA Finals within five years of the big three areas demise and looking to get back there this season. So today, not only are we going to talk about just how they did it, but we're going to talk about the culture in Miami that pushes them to not only work as hard as they do, but to find the players that fit their system and do what certain teams have been trying decades to do. Now, losing the best player in the NBA is not an easy thing to do, and it was a pretty turbulent season in 2014-2015 for Miami, but they still had two-thirds of big three on their roster, championship pedigree in both Chris Anderson and Mario Chalmers, and a bunch of new faces like Luol Deng and Josh McRoberts to fill out point forward and scoring roles that left vacant by LeBron as he left Miami, and young rookies like Tyler Johnson, Shabazz Napier, and James Ennis that came in and contributed right away. And coming out the gates of 5-2, and two, it looked like this team could actually prove that they really didn't need LeBron for a bulk of the success they had. But just as that optimism set in, it immediately left as the season subsequently fell apart. Josh McRoberts being out in the offseason with a toe injury in training camp and the injury bug decided to consistently bite Miami over and over again. With Chris Bosh only playing 44 games in the season, the Wayne Wade missing 20 games with a variety of knee injuries, Shabazz Napier going down for the second half of the season, and Josh McRoberts coming back after his toe surgery and then tearing his meniscus. It was a miracle that Miami even won 37 games this season. And to put it in perspective, the projected start lineup coming into the season was Mario Chalmers, Dwayne Wade, Luol Deng, Josh McRoberts, and Chris Bosh. That lineup only played 24 minutes together the entire season. And the backup starting lineup that came in the second half of the season in Wade, Chalmers, Deng, Bosh, and Whiteside only played 30 minutes together in the entire season. But it wasn't all bad, because even through the worst of it, the Miami Heat still made moves that heavily benefited them for their future. And that started in late November and early December, where the Miami Heat decided to waive guard Shannon Brown to acquire what was an injury necessity with Chris Anderson going down and Hassan Whiteside. What they didn't know though was that they just acquired a franchise building piece and a double double machine that let the NBA know he arrived on January 25th in a game for the ages against Chicago Bulls where he tallied 14 points, 13 rebounds, and 12 blocks, truly cementing himself as an NBA player. And around the trade deadline, Pat Riley decided to play the phone to try to answer what was another one of the Miami Heat's biggest problems. They had the least productive guard rotation in the entire NBA in Mario Chalmers, Shabazz Napier, and Norris Cole. And to do that, he brought in crafty guard from Phoenix and Goran Dragic who was unhappy in his role and looked to bolster Miami's playoff efforts this season and he did very much did that as he averaged 16.6 points and 5.3 assists in the 26 games he played with us he made a deadly backcourt duel with Dwayne Wade as they averaged 48.5% from the field which was the highest mark for any backcourt in the NBA that season and gave Miami what was looked like the best center to point guard duo they had since Tim Hardaway and Alonzo Mourning so overall while this season was very turbulent and had, had a lot of bad like the start of Chris Bosch's demise as an NBA player and the glaring health concerns of Dwayne Wade, the Miami Heat still set themselves up to be great the following year as they showed in April as the Miami Heat went 9-7 and seven, and Hassan Whiteside was the biggest standout in that month as he averaged 16.8 points, 12.5 rebounds, and 3.2 blocks to close out the season. Even though the Miami Heat still came up short going to the playoffs, you can definitely expect them at the end of this year to definitely come out swinging the next year. Now, going into the 2015-2016 season, the Miami Heat's expectations for themselves were high, while outside, it was very mixed reviews. In the offseason, the Miami Heat bolstered their roster in a positive way. With a disappointing end to the previous, it birthed a 10th pick in the NBA draft the Miami Heat used on Duke defensive-minded standout Justice Winslow, which some people felt was a steal at the 10th spot. And in the second round, they grabbed Tennessee guard Josh Richardson, who earned himself a roster spot as a summer league standout. And along with those guys, the Miami Heat picked up Amari Stott and Mayan Jello Green in free agency with the only notable pieces they said goodbye to was Shabazz Napier and that was semi-notable at best but even with these moves the consensus view of the Miami Heat was unpredictable if everything went right this season they'd be one of the best teams in the league with a defensive star in Hassan Whiteside two all-stars in the Wayne Wade and Chris Bosh and a bright future with Justice Winslow but the season didn't go exactly like that but it did burst some optimism the way Wade was able to stay relatively healthy and play most of the season in 74 games Hassan Whiteside showed that the previous season was no fluke and cemented himself as one of the best shot blockers and defensive centers in the NBA 
NBA. Just as Winslow showed that he was an extremely solid defender with great up offensive upside if he's able to work on his game. And Goran Dragic, while he didn't flourish, he showed that he was a solid backcourt partner for Dwayne Wade throughout the season. But like I said, the season didn't go exactly as planned and there was definitely some bad. Chris Bosh only played 53 games this season as the blood clots in his lungs came back up and he was basically forced to retire at the age of 31. The Miami Heat were one of the best defensive teams in the NBA with some pretty good perimeter defenders and a anchor down low in Hassan Whiteside, but offensively they were lackluster and below average at best and that was a problem they tried to sought after to fix throughout the season as they got rid of underwhelming performers like Mario Chalmers and James Ennis and went after Joe Johnson who just cleared waivers after being released by the Brooklyn Nets. But even with all these problems, the Miami Heat showed an incredible level of resilience and was able to go 48-34 and 34 in the NBA, which was a good enough for the third seed in the Eastern Conference. And going to the NBA playoffs, the Miami Heat had some expectations that I think they pretty much matched. Dwayne Wade put on an absolute show in the first round with clutch bucket after clutch bucket, talking in fans' face as I think we all remember, per purple shirt guy averaging 19 in the series against the Hornets in seven games, and then he upped his level of play even higher against the Toronto Raptors in the second round with a 38 point performance and a game three loss, a 38 point performance and a game four win and averaged 23 points per game throughout a seven game series. And in a game where they did get blown out, I think a lot of Miami Heat fans can remember just how bad the refereeing was in that game seven. But overall, one thing Dwayne Wade did show was that he was not washed and he definitely deserved his money coming in to the next season. And that caused some problems. 2016-2017 offseason wasn't one that was favorably remembered by Heat fans. It started off with devastating news of Chris Bosh's Heat career finally being over as he was forced to retire with blood clots. And after that, the bad news just kept coming. Word spread that Dwayne Wade and Pat Riley weren't seeing eye to eye on a deal. Dwayne Wade felt like all the pay cuts he's taken and years of contribution to this franchise, he deserves to finally be compensated. And Pat Riley simply felt like it was a business. The free agency market was full of a lot of players that could help the Heat and he felt like the money was better used elsewhere. So with Dwayne Wayne Wade and Pat Riley not budging on the two-year $40 million offer, thus ended the greatest Miami Heat player's time in Miami. But as one were closed, another one opened. Even though the big three era was completely done, the Miami Heat did miss out on a couple big free agency pieces. They still were able to snag back what was seen as a franchise building piece in Hassan Whiteside, and the Heat still had their crafty guard in Goran Dragic, who still struggled a little bit with Dwayne Wade next to him at the guard spot. And to replace Dwayne Wade, the Miami Heat picked up Deion Waiters. Miami Heat looked like a completely different team from years before, and a lot of people had a lot of questions about them. Do they have the talent to compete? Are they even going to be able to make the playoffs this year? And soon, a lot of those concerns were rightfully proven true because in the first 41 games of the season, the Miami Heat were 11 and 30, right there in the lottery. They were bottom feeders in the NBA. Hassan's numbers are great, but many people questioned if he really had any impact on the game at all. What was supposed to be a year of elevation for Justice Winslow turned into an underwhelming year of play and then later being sidelined with shoulder surgery and only playing 16 games in the entire season. And coupled that with in consistent shooting from Deion Waiters, this season looked like it was about to be a wash. But just like that, it felt like a switch just flipped. With lineups throughout the season solidifying, guys knowing their role, and guys coming back from injuries, the Miami Heat showed a resurgent in the second half of the season. Hassan Whiteside looked like an amazing rim protector and an amazing defender with hell raising defense throughout the second half. What felt like clutch jumpers every single night from Deion Waiters, which was climaxed by this game winner against the unbeatable Golden State Warriors, it was a roller coaster for the second half of the season. But sadly, he ended in disappointment as a simple tiebreaker which was ironically against Dwayne Wade and Jimmy Butler led Bulls team kept them out of the playoffs. But fans remember this season as the epitome of Heat culture. These guys stayed in shape, stayed ready, played de great defense and competed in every single game and that showed a lot of optimism going to the next couple years. Now, throughout the offseason, uh, there was a lot of chatter surrounding what the Miami Heat lost instead of how good this team could be. The Miami Heat had a surefire top five pick around the first half of the season being 11 and 30. But in the resurgence in the second half, that pick dropped all the way down to 14th. And what seems like a starter starter draft class, many thought Miami missed out on what could be a franchise player. But this is when you don't count them out. As today, hindsight's 2020, they picked one of the best players in this draft class. As a selective defensive standout from Kentucky, Ben Adebayo, who immediately showed his defensive prowess 
prowess and glimpses of offensive potential. But even going through the season with some optimism and some of the good things that in the offseason, this team still has some disappointments. Just as Winslow's offensive development took a screeching halt. I saw Whiteside's overall impact offensively and defensively took a staggering step behind, but none of that meant anything on February 8th as the shining sun of Miami returned. As in a completely roster overhaul, the Cleveland Cavaliers traded Dwayne Wade back to the Miami Heat. And at 32 and 24, the Heat were in the playoff hunt, but was on what was a five game slide at the time. But going 500 for the remainder of the season, the Heat managed to snag the sixth seed and were pitted against the 76ers in the first round. And in a quick five game series, the Heat's weaknesses were shown. Hassan Whiteside was not the building block many people thought he was, as he was decimated by Joel Embiid. This was Winslow was almost non factor. And in fact, majority of the Miami Heat could not get any offense, and the only true consistent offense we had was from Josh Richardson and Goran Dragic, which was very telling considering the same draft, just as Winslow was our 10th pick and Josh Richardson was picked in the second round. Now, in the 2018-2019 season, the Heat didn't have much to look forward to. With very little cap space, this roster was just a rehash of the previous year. This team seemed to center around doing a send-off tour and developing some of the young guys this year. But even with that being said, there were still some underlying issues. The Hassan Whiteside and coach Eric Spolstra just didn't seem like they were seeing eye to eye, and Hassan's numbers took a heavy hit. And with that, the Miami Heat seemed to want to accelerate Bam Adebayo's development a little bit more, and Hassan didn't like that one bit at all, and he seems like you're just watching the bridge between him and the Miami Heat burn slow which is very sad to watch since this guy came in very unknown and was able to snag a four-year 98 million dollar contract and just seemed to just go downhill from there but what the Miami Heat lost in Hassan Whiteside they gained an inspiring play from Justice Winslow, Josh Richardson, and Bam Adebayo. Jay Rich took a huge jump in his production and was able to average 16.6 points per game this season and was almost a centerpiece for a Jimmy Butler trade midway through the year. Justice Winslow took over the point guard roles for Goran Dragic as he only stood up for 36 games this season and it looked like he found his niche. He played making took a big jump in his scoring also took a nice little leap and he overall looked very comfortable guarding two guards and threes this season and Bam Adebayo's defensive prowess and offensive potential continued to shine but overall it wasn't enough as the Miami Heat closed out this year saying goodbye to Dwayne Wade and was on the wrong side of the playoff pitcher. Now, the 2019 offseason was an amazing one for the Heat, because with a disappointing end to the previous season, the Heat found themselves in the lottery again, and with this time, with the 13th pick, they took Tyler Hero, a Kentucky guard who could shoot the lights out. And some people felt he may have went a little bit too high in this draft, but that wasn't even the highlight of the offseason, as in free agency, the Miami Heat got their franchise player, as they had a sign and trade deal with the 76ers to send Josh Richardson to get Jimmy Butler, a guy that fit Miami Heat culture to a T. But not only that, the Heat had a mix of amazing talent that just came out of nowhere from when drafted guys like Kendrick Nunn that was high up in rookie of the year voting, Duncan Robinson who became one of the best shooters in the NBA, Tyler Hero who immediately came in and showed why he's an amazing shooter and electric scorer who had a myriad of clutch jumpers throughout the season, Jimmy Butler was having a career year and showed why he was a top 10 player in the NBA but those weren't even the biggest jumps for the Miami Heat. That came from Bam Adebayo who with Hassan Whiteside's departure from the Heat, the starting center role was all to him and he flourished as he nearly doubled his scoring averages, became one of the the best defenders in the league and showcased his staggering playmaking ability. The Heat were back and they were running the league just until the season halted. But in the months the Heat had off, they were working, constantly staying ready. And that's when the NBA bubble was announced. And in the first round, they faced a depleted Indiana Pacers team and they handled them relatively easily. Now to resume the NBA season and the NBA playoffs, they announced the bubble in Orlando. And the Miami Heat were one of the teams that were most ready for this. And in the first round, they faced the depleted Indiana Pacers and handled them relatively easily. The bubble breakout and TJ Warren was shut down by Jimmy Butler and the Heat were simply just too much as they ended this team within four games. The real challenge read its head in the Milwaukee Bucks and Giannis Antetokounmpo, the first seed in the East, the MVP, and one of the best teams in the NBA. But the series wasn't predetermined. Many people saw how Bam Adebayo gave Giannis problems the regular season and Chris Middleton's postseason game was suspect at best. In a surprising fashion, what was supposed to be a long and hard fought series turned into a hard thrashing. While the games were close, Miami's ability to close them out made them look like there were no contest at the end. But with that series win, the Miami Heat were now targets. They weren't supposed to be here. With amazing scoring from Jordan Goran Dragic throughout the playoffs, putting up 20 a night, staggering play off the bench from Tyler Hero, amazing light saw shooting by Duncan Robinson, an overall all NBA level play from the Heat's two stars in Bam and Jimmy, the Heat looked like a true threat in the conference finals as they met the, the Boston Celtics and they showed in game one that they meant business as Bam Adebayo still has one of the greatest game ceiling blocks. I 
I've ever seen on Jason Tatum. And overall, the series didn't really give too much of a problem for the Heat. With Tyler Hero's 37 point performance in game four and Bam's 32 point closeout performance in game six, it really didn't feel like the Celtics gave all that much of a fight to the Heat. And the Heat were once again in the NBA Finals. But now, the task truly gets daunting as you're no longer facing the Eastern opponents. You're facing what is probably the best team in the NBA at the time in the Lakers, LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And it looks like the Miami Heat finally met their match as they went down quickly 0-2 in the series. A series where Bam Adebayo was suffering injuries, Goran Dragic was in and out of the lineup. The Heat just looked like they finally met their match. But in a staggering game three performance, Jimmy Butler kept the Heat from the dreaded 3-0 deficit and put up a 40 point triple double. And in another staggering game five performance to keep the Heat from losing the series, he out LeBron James with another triple double and gave it everything he had to keep the Heat's title hopes alive. But it wasn't enough. In a blog game six, the Miami Heat did as much as they could do, but it was finally over. Even though with that loss, the season was a great one. Jimmy Butler solidified himself amongst the NBA elites. Mamet Abaya pushed his name as one of the best young players in the league. And the Heat scouting crew and draft crew showed that they're one of the best in the league after they gathered an amazing gang of talent with young players like Kendrick Nunn, finding Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero at the 13th pick in the NBA draft. The Heat looked like they were back and they were not going anywhere anytime soon. They'd be here again in the NBA Finals again. Now, the 2020 to 2021 season is where I think the Miami Heat get a little bit too much slander for what happened to them. After the NBA Finals ended in October, the NBA announced that the season would resume again on December. The Miami Heat would get two months of a break while a lot of teams didn't even make the bubble and a lot of other teams had four to six months off. The Miami Heat and Los Angeles Lakers got two months and it looked like they definitely got two months as the season resumed. As they came out looking lackluster, not like themselves, Tally Hero took a big drop in his performances as he didn't have an offseason to work on his game at all. Jimmy Butler, while having a career year, missed some significant time throughout the season. Bam Adebayo upped his play again but wasn't consistent. Goran Dragic was in and out of the lineup. The Heat were just not the same. And come playoff time, it showed as a team that they handled relatively well in the bubble, getting an upgrade in Drew Holiday, and they decimated the Heat, knocking them out 4-0. And the Miami Heat now were laughing stocks in the NBA. How could a team that just made the NBA Finals not even win a game in the NBA playoffs? That definitely shows that the bubble doesn't count, right? I don't think so. The Heat were a team that thrived off cohesion. They didn't have that this season. They had no rest. And as you can see, the Los Angeles Lakers and the Heat, the two teams that made the finals the year before were both out in the first round. That showed that the limited amount of time they had for rest definitely affected them. But again, in last offseason, the Miami Heat again showed why they're one of the best franchises in the NBA as they brought in Kyle Lowry, a guard that can definitely help calm the Heat down and take off some of the playmaking roles off Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. Tyler Hero so far this season has shown an amazing, amazing ability to be a six man and a scorer and has upped this game to an astronomical level. They picked up somebody like TPJ Tucker who they were trying to get the previous year, somebody who fit Heat culture also, hard nose, great defense, and shoot the lights out from the corner. Guys like Duncan Robson, while has struggled so far this season, has shown that he still has a shooting touch. And in Miami Heat fashion, even with all the COVID people out, the Heat has been able to keep up this level of play and it's 26 and 15 at this point in the season. And it's all because they know how to draft and pick up guys from the G League. Omer Yurtsevin has had, I think, a 15 game stretch of averaging double digit rebounds and is one of the best rookies in the league. Max Struess has upped his game to an astronomical level. Guys like Gabe Vincent has finally proved that he can definitely be an NBA guard. And even right now, a guy that they were supposed to pick up because of COVID protocols and Kyle Guy looks like he's an amazing solid NBA player can be a contributor to this team. Overall, the Miami Heat look like an amazing gang this season. When they get healthy, they get back Bam Adebayo, they get back Jimmy Butler, they get back Victor Oladipo. This team is going to be dangerous. I definitely think they have a title chance this season. They look like one of the best teams in the East as they're also one of the unhealthiest and they're still able to keep up and be the third seed in the conference. But overall, let me know what you guys think of the video. This is one of my first longer form content overall. The Miami Heat is my favorite team in the league and I just wanted to go over just how they got here and the struggles that us as Heat fans had to go through to watch. But we're not like other franchises. We're able 
to pull ourselves up from the bottom with very little and we've been able to get back to an amazing level of play and while being in a large market does help us a little bit overall i still want to give props to not only eric spolstra for able to keep this team together pat riley for finding guys that definitely fit this culture and jimmy butler bam Adebayo, tyler hero for just being talent that was able to stick together and grow together and play amazingly well but with that being said check out my discord down below uh check out my podcast guys i love if you guys check it out um we post twice a week we posted our first episode a couple days ago and i love if you guys go check that out uh if you want to follow me on my socials my twitter is in the description down below with that being said this is flb that's my time and i'm out